Hello, this is a presentation made by me, Jackie Curley, um, on July the 13th, 2022, um, entitled Blagden Between the Wars, so 1919 to 1939. The reigns of three kings during that time, George V, Edward VIII, and George VI. We're not talking about the wars today, but the years in between, so 20 years, during which time Blagden remained a very self-sufficient village, in terms of employment, shops, transport, garages, with some notable changes in the development of motor cars and farm machinery during the time, moving away from horse dependence. In 1911, the civil population was 915, which grew to 948 in 1931. Today, we're around 1100. We've been, a, we've been able to study the minutes of parish council meetings, parish magazines edited by the rectors, school records, oral memories of now deceased residents and Kelly's directories. In 1919, there were also, as well as St Andrew's Anglican Church, Wesleyan and Baptist chapels, which by 1939 were described as Methodist and Baptist, but still going strong. A map from about the 1930s here, the West End, the village is divided into West End, East End and Street End. West End is where the church is, you can see that there um, in the middle. The majority of the shops now. If you look um, at the bottom of the picture, you've got the Seymour Arms there. And if you come down off the hill past the Seymour Arms, you'll go on down past what is now the village shop. Uh, the George Inn that used to be opposite, now George House. You can either turn left and go on towards Western Supermare, or you go on down the hill, Station Road, and you'll come eventually to the lake. The East End, which is where the school was, uh, much more of a farming area, fields and uh, pasture land, orchards too. But you can see on the right hand side, the newly built council houses, which were put in in 1928, post-war therefore, not much else in the way of development, although there were four houses just here where the cursory is built by the Wills Estate in the early 1920s. Um, all of the other areas, Score Lane, the Score as it's called now, where there is now a lot of housing, those council houses and others were built after the war, so 50s, 60s, 70s. I've divided the 20 years into roughly five year chunks. And uh, so in 1918, you've got the uh, right to vote for most women over 30, not all, uh, the signing of the armistice, dedication of the memorial chapel in memory of the men who died during the war in the church, and Kelly's conve uh, conveyances to Bristol it names certain people, Jacob Lyons, who went on to be a, a very well-known carrier with his buses, uh, George Fear, William Stoll, and in 1920, April, in April, military conscription was abolished. Moving on a little bit, the sports clubs were combining the use of the mead as a recreation field. So we had cricket and football, and later the cricket joined the hockey at the park field opposite Coombe Lodge gates. St Hugh's Charterhouse was restored. The Bristol Tramway Company's motor buses ran to Bristol seven times a day, rather more than we have now. And in 1923, on the 11th of November, Armistice Day, the dedication of the book containing the role of all the men who served in the Great War was placed in the Memorial Chapel. The Memorial Chapel on your right there, lots of the uh, vestments, the hangings, the, um, the hardware, if you like, was all given to the uh, St Andrew's Guild, who were putting it all together, made by many of the people in the parish. The church itself, as you'll see on the left, at this time had no rood screen. Lord Winterstoke, William Henry Wills, bought the estate in around 1880, and he continued to expand his holding, buying up land, farms, and then renting them out. Um, but buying, um, building some new farmhouses and cottages as well. They were often built with this style that became known as the Wills Estate um, mark, really, with lots of exposed woodwork, 
gables um, built and designed locally, many of them um, designed by Frank Wills, who was a cousin of Lord Winterstoke. Lord Winterstoke had the church rebuilt in 1907 um, and the rude screen and the old altar table were removed. The screen actually ended up in Buckcombe Church and the altar was found eventually in Nelsea Court and gifted back to the church in 1932. Lord Winterstoke actually died before our period in 1911 and as he had no sons, a cousin, Sir George Alfred Wills, who lived at Burwalls in Bristol, inherited the estate. He never became a lord, but he was made a baronet in 1923. He was a great philanthropist, both in Blagden and Bristol. In 1919, he and the Bristol Water Company, which had bought lots of farmland, including dwellings as a buffer for the reservoir, were the major landowners. This is a photograph of the old Coombe Lodge in Lord Winterstoke's day. And the estate provided much employment in the village, both in the house and on the land. In 1940, for instance, there were 43 employees just on this area alone. Although this picture is from before the war, it's rather a nice one, and it was probably taken in about 1913. And it shows the outdoor workers of the farm um, although the, apart from the butler who's on the left, um, bailiff on the right, um, blacksmith, carpenters, gardeners, all there in the stable yard. Most of those men were probably been exempt from serving because of their work on the estate or their age, they would have been too old. After the war, Many of the large estates found it very difficult to still exist. They couldn't get enough workers and um, they were too expensive to run. One of those was Hazel Manor above Compton Martin. Um, that estate was sold in 1924 with the house at the time, although the house learnt, uh, burnt down in 1929. And after that, the estate um, comprised cottages and land only. The Mendip Lodge estate, up in the woods above uh, Langford um, was also sold in 1923. It was uh, four rooms, nine bedrooms, 101 acres, all on, in, on sale for 2,900. Glorious views, which it certainly did have. It was built, uh, bought by the Wills estate um, who owned it for many years. And some, Older people may just remember the former Mendip Lodge roundhouses, which were down on the Bath Road. And it's said that the family who looked after them and kept the gates uh, lived in one side and went across to the other side to sleep at night where their bedroom was. One of the great changes during our time was the motor vehicles um, allowing people to leave the village much more easily. You can see in the picture on the top right, outside the post office, we've got a vehicle. Behind it, there's another one which is much more like one of the old horse-drawn carriages, obviously built on that sort of design. A shower bank down at the bottom there, that they were widely used. All the various clubs had their outings, um, Sunday School, Mother's Union, Bell Ringers, Choir, all the sports clubs, and they would travel some distance for their annual days out. This is the one of the football team, which became very successful in 1921. They obviously won a cup there, you can see, and there's their vehicle that they were using. Millius and Sons of Ripford um, were the local builders and they built several of the buildings for Bristol Waterworks, BWW there. Um, Yew Tree Cottages, which were built for uh, their own workers in Garstons, the engineer's house down by the pumping house and the inspection house. Millier gave his workforce annual outings from 1899 onwards. And uh, they went somewhere different every year. This particular one shows a visit to the River Dart and Dartmouth. Alfred Millier is there on his motorcycle on the left. He also had one of the first cars in the area. In 1933, 
the workers and their wives left by Sharabank to catch the night train, first class with um, supper from Temple Meads, up to Blackpool where they spent the whole of the next day and then they got back on the night train to get home at about 7 a.m. in the morning. Quite a trip. As I said, the parish uh, was pretty self-sufficient in many ways and allotments um, would account for much of the growing of fresh food that went on. The parish council were responsible for the allotments, would rent them out, and uh, there were certain rules that they would put in place. During the war, the Ministry of Agriculture also decreed what could and couldn't be grown. They had problems um, with disease in potatoes, for instance, and rats periodically. This shows an area of allotment, quite a large one. Um, if you're familiar with the village, you come down off the hill, down the street end, down to the wards of the Seymour Arms, which is down here. There's a little cut through called Liberty Lane here, which meets up with the bottom of street end. And the Bath Road runs along in front of the Seymour Arms and turns fairly sharp right down through the high street. All of this area here is allotments which was later sold in 1933. Uh, it had been glebe land. It was sold by the rector of the time and uh, later built all over. There were other allotments too. At the bottom of Grib Lane, where the new cemetery is, um, there are still allotments, but they were over a much larger area at one time. They were owned by the Wills estate. Parish council were responsible for, or uh, liaised with lots of the services. We were part of Axbridge Rural District Council. And so uh, the parish council were liaised with them about things like housing. There was great concern after the war that there wasn't enough affordable housing um, for the young people of the village. And in 1919, Mr. Millier, who was on the parish council, uh, reported that under a scheme for better housing of working classes, it was proposed to build 10 houses at Blagden, six on the Bath Road in the Mead, and four on the hill near Quarry House. A motion was passed by the local council advising the housing committee in Axbridge to build two on the hill, two more in the village, in addition to those already proposed to be built there. In fact, there was much wrangling over which land should be used and who would be eligible, and eventually the 12 Dipland council houses were built in 1928. I mentioned the four houses which the Wills had built in the score. Um, this is a, a newer picture, this is a 1950s photograph, but you can see the cottages at the back there. This is what one of them looked like in the year 2000. And the area below the cottages was garden um, and uh, farmland, but the school, had a garden there for many years. We go back to the services. The refuse was um, dumped at the bottom of Grib Lane. That caused um, considerable worry over when, when it was <laughs> taken over by rats, etc. And every now and again, it had to be um, rolled in. There was no actual refuse collection until the parish council reluctantly accepted that, not until 1939. It became obvious by then that rubbish was not being disposed of responsibly, despite the girl guides at the time distributing leaflets appealing for people to follow the rules. In the early days, of course, there, there was uh, most of the rubbish that was deposited would be eventually rotted down before the days of plastic, etc. The Diplin resid residents also used an old lime kiln near their houses, which was much closer for them than coming along to the grid. But again, nobody was willing to actually open, uh, empty it, so that caused some problems too. Water, there were constant problems with water supply, although you would think there'd be a lot. Ours comes from the top of Mendip Springs, um, not from the reservoir. And the, the water supply to farms was often under question and uh, why was there not enough coming through? Why was there so much wastage from the tanks on the top, et cetera? Standpipes were introduced in 1908, 
but Mains Water to Homes only in the 1930s when people could pay for their um, linkage. There were five fire hydrants in place, right, um, from 1927, but no actual fire engine. Coombe Lodge had its own engine cart, which carried water, which could be borrowed by the village if necessary. Sewage, um, although there was a sewage works, which had been built by um, Bristol Water for their pumping station, and some sewage was pumped that they didn't want going into the lake, the main uh, sewage scheme for the village didn't come about until about 1930. Um, it was cost quite a lot of money and the parish council asked for an application to be made to the Unemployment Grants Committee. The Dipland houses in 1928 had been built with a sewage pipe which passed across the grid lane allotments and down to the treatment works. Several buildings did have electricity in 1920. Um, things like the Mendip, Lodge, the Mendip Bungalow Hotel, Nordrex Sanatorium, um, but places like the church didn't have it until 1930. They were using carbide until that time. Uh, eventually, Vernon Wills, the Lord of the Manor at the time, paid for the church and the rectory and the parish room to have electricity supplied. There was a public meeting in 1926 to uh, explain the costs of bringing it into villages. But we know that in 1930, um, the poles were being put up because the AA put out reports for roads um, and there was a, a newspaper report in 1930 referring to the road being closed in Blagdon for tar spreading and the installation of electricity poles. Postal service and the telephones, we know that um, there was a twice a day postal delivery, more than we get nowadays, of course. And there was a comment that in 1934, 16 houses on the Diplin Road weren't getting their afternoon delivery. The council instructed the, the clerk to write to the postmaster surveyor and ask if there could be a second delivery. And they also discussed whether they could get a half day holiday each week for the Blagdon postman. Apparently they were the only ones in the district who did not enjoy this benefit. So the clerk was instructed to write to the postmaster asking that a scheme be introduced whereby the postman could enjoy the modern method of a half day holiday each week. Although individual people did have telephones um, in 1927, um, it wasn't until 1932 that the automatic telephone exchanged and the un un unattended kiosk were put in place. Several pubs, which were very important to the village. The top there, the new inn, Gilbert Lyons had that during the 20s and he was also a coal merchant at the time. Friendly societies would meet um, in the various pubs. So the Seymour Arms, for instance, was used by the Buffaloes. They had an upstairs room where they could seat 100 people for playing match dinners, etc., etc. The Queen Adelaide. The George opposite the current village stores that was a pub for many years that's actually a 1950s picture but it hadn't changed very much in that time and you can see the village club behind it with its distinctive woodwork and the live and let live there in the 1930s car outside very popular with uh, fishermen you can see behind uh, on the other side of the road there that's where the school gardens were in that area there. The George was the home of the Foresters Friendly Society. They would meet there regularly. And it was also said that anyone who was uh, apprehended would be uh, handcuffed to, I think, a fireplace overnight uh, before they were taken on to uh, the magistrates at Paxbridge. Many shops in the village. In 1919, there were at least eight, and it seems likely they all sold tobacco and general groceries. People grow, grew their own vegetables. Sarah Lyons, top right, had a general store in Street End, what is now Lambton Cottage. And the Lyons family then became carriers. Jacob Lyons used to park his bus up there opposite the shop. 
and then they moved down to Mendip Garage on Street End. Redwoods on the left was the main village stores. They sold almost everything. Grocery, ironmongers, drapers, outfitters, feedstuffs, washing machines. Donald Cole, who later ran the shop much later after the war, said they sold everything but secondhand coffins. The bakery on the Bath Road was run first by a family called Hemmings and then Cole, who I'll say a bit more about later. And Sammy Sampson's shop, as it was known, um, opposite the tennis court was the uh, news agents, probably sweets and things as well. The shop is now called Highgrove. Um, and Mr. Cecil Sampson's father was nicknamed Boots, but he was bedridden. His bed was in Sammy's shop. And when the men went for a haircut, they had to kneel down by the side of the bed for him to cut their hair. And he kept a flagon of draft beer tucked under the covers between his labours. Apparently he had a hand propelled wheelchair. One day he was given an outing to Weston by having his wheelchair towed behind a steamroller all the way. Opposite the village club, we had the cobblers, Ash was in here, and then Wiggly's Butchers is just beside them on there and the post office a little bit further down. The dainty stores was along them in the narrow section of um, High Street. They sold sweets, provisions, tobacco. Bert Young here, seen with the estate lorry, is outside the shop next to Hannah Moore. Hannah Moore, the white one here. And this is what is now called the Upper Barton. And you can see it was a shop with windows right out to the pavement, which is no longer there. Well, they are no longer there. Um, at one time it was, um, it was run as a fish shop and a, a grocer's. Sovereign Cottage, bottom right, was also a general grocer's shop. There were two sisters, the Durban sisters, who ran a shop in Cherry, Street, Cherry Trees, as it is now, on Church Street. And when one of them married a Mr. Cryer, she moved to Sovereign Cottage and set up a stores there as well. There seems to have been room for any number of stores. The story uh, about Sovereign Cottage, which is well known, is that in 1927, there was a fire. At that time, there was a Mary Ann Filer living there who hoarded her sovereigns under her bed. And uh, during the fire, they all rolled down the road. And the house obviously became Sovereign Cottage later on. By 1939, many of these businesses remained. And you could also find almost every other trade you might need. So Wilf Saint was at the bottom of the Slad Acre making leather goods. Ambrose Carpenter, the old saddlery, had a paper round and made harness and saddles. There was a garage, two garages and a filling station, all building trades. And as I mentioned earlier, Gilbert Lyons at the New Inn was also a coal merchant. Many of them had a, a second string to their bow. Theo Saint, for instance, was the carpenter, but also the undertaker. Coles, who I mentioned as being the baker, started off in Gilcombe, the top of Church Street, and then moved to the Bath Road Bakery at Highgrove. This is one of his advertising um, leaflets at the top here, Blagden Bakery, Blagden. And on the back of that was a useful list of dates and addresses and phone numbers and bus timetables and things like that, that he was obviously give out to his customers. He later took over Redwoods, but not actually until just after the war. He also had another little shop where the school farm bed and breakfast house is now. It was run first by a family called Woods as a general grocer's, and then Coles had it as a second outlet. He would sell his bakery items in there, I think. His wife also sold uh, confectionery and sweets as well as the cakes. Some of their advertising, Nelson was the postmaster in the post office stores, but he was also a tea dealer, grocer, draper. And you can see it says there, ready-made clothes and family mourning. Wiggly's the butchers had an early vehicle to deliver their meat and Coles and Son 
had the vehicle for the bakery and you can see his basket on the special um, bracket on the front there. Another business which often gave cause for complaint because of its noxious sp smell was Springfield's Fat Factory, as it was known, where Mendit Wood Shavings is now on the top of the hill, just along from Charterhouse. Uh, the carcasses were taken up there to be rendered down for fat, and some of that went to local fish and chip shops. But it, it was a pretty unpleasant smell if the wind was in the wrong direction. At the beginning of our period, uh, we had Reverend Lambrick, um, who did a great deal of work for the church and also kept a very valuable diary of what was going on in World War I. And we've published those since in magazines in the centenary of the First World War. And he was providing the most up-to-date news that he had of the Blagden men and women who were serving, uh, if they'd been wounded, if they were home on leave, and obviously deaths when they occurred. He died quite suddenly in 1929. His wife, Mrs. Lambrick, um, she was the daughter of Captain Newnham. Now the Newnhams had Blagdon Court, um, which she inherited after they died. She and Reverend Lambrick had no children. You can see them in the picture in 1923 on the left, and they're with Anne Oliver, who became very well, quite locally well known because she celebrated her 100th birthday at Oliver Cottage near the top of Church Street. And also in the picture, Dr. Pinio, I think the, the front one, and uh, Samuel Filer, who was uh, clerk to the council and many other things behind them. <coughs> Excuse me. The Lambricks, um, or he in particular, published the parish magazine and uh, didn't always make enough money for its um, being spread around the village and so he would often have to dip into his own pocket to fund it. They were both, he and his wife, very keen on missionary work. They spent a lot of time raising money for that, um, believing that Christianity and Bible knowledge was really the only way. The magazines included fairly long, dense articles on religious matters and uh, the church seasons, um, people going to church or not going to church, but it also included reports of local clubs and societies and their accounts would be published in these magazines. Also details about fundraising events and entertainments. And there were many clubs and societies you can see there a huge range sports clubs those linked to the church bell ringers choir choral society there was a band guides the st andrew's guild were important in that they were put together to raise funds for the memorial chapel and there was also a meccano club in 1920 um there was a new society set up, a Blagden Recreation Society. It was called, it was there for the recreation and amusement caterers. They were to provide opportunities for the holding of sports of all kinds. They had the support of Sir George Wills, and with that they published, they purchased the mead grounds from Mrs. Lambrick, who by this time had inherited Blagden Court, and they issued shares, 2,000 they hoped to issue at 10 shillings a share. And on Whit Monday in 1921, there was an alfresco concert with the Chew Valley Band and the newly acquired field was used for sports and dancing in the evening. In 1923, the first Blagden and District annual school sports took place. And various sports societies were very actively, regularly playing, game, playing teams from other areas. Unfortunately, in 1924, through lack of support, um, financially, I imagine, the mead was sold back to Sir George Wills and the trustees were set up to rent the field from him. But two years later, the trustees had to relinquish the land and dissolve their committee and the Coombe Lodge Estates would take it over. And this was the case until 1937, when Lady Wills gave the mead to the parish as a silver jubilee memorial. <coughs> 
The local dramatic society didn't um, put on its first play until 1935, but there had been visiting players, a mummers group at Christmas time, and lots of the groups that put on uh, fundraising activities included some drama, some poetry reading, some singing um, as part of their fundraising. Lady Constance Mullison was quite famous and she um, became very well known in the village for quite a while. Uh, this picture is of her in 1929. She rented rooms in initially Walnut Cottage with the Lyons family, Walnut Tree House, sorry. Um, she later moved with them to the new Glen Sheen, which was built at the top of the high street in around 1929-30 and had a room there with them for some years. And then they bought Walnut Tree uh, House. And again, she would come periodically to the village and stay with them. She traveled all over. Uh, she wrote plays um, and she was uh, an actress too. And she did help with some of the village productions. She wrote several books. One of them uh, written in 1931 describes life in the village at that time in a quite interesting way. There was also a minstrel troupe of about 12 members who used burnt cork to black up and a brass band. Sir George Wills loaned 500 pounds for the 22 instruments and they had about 20 members. They used to play in the flower show tent in the evenings among other things. Um, the flowers would be removed apart from the Wills display which was in the center around a rostrum and the band played from there. Sir George also loaned the Choral Society money to buy a piano, which was gradually paid back over the years with entertainments with a view to raising money for the piano. Some other organisations, we recently had a talk about friendly societies, which were, had many members and were there to help uh, during times of sickness, particularly in years prior to our period. There was a temperance society, League of Nations had a branch, and the missionary societies included the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel was very active. The British Legion also. And for the children, it was Sunday school, but there was also something called the King's Messengers, which was the junior version of the SPG. Uh, missionary society. They were taken out every year, uh, always to Western Supermare. They would go onto the beach and then they would always go to Woolworths, um, had a good time. But they also had uh, Christmas entertainments too, Father Christmas, and later on film shows, um, courtesy of Lady Wills, um, Chaplin and Disney and so on. Presents, which were, um, I think, um, there was a fund around the village to pay for their Christmas presents. The adult groups, such as the choir, the ringers, the mother's union, they all went on long outings. The Wesleyans had some outings. They went to Bath, for instance, and uh, enjoyed their days out very much. Our next timeline starts in 26. At this time, John Westbrook, who had been at the school since 1885, resigned. He was also the church organist and um, choir master. There was a general strike in 26. Telephones first mentioned in 27. School uniform adopted in 27. And in 1928, um, there was a curriculum change nationally, which um, suggested agricultural science for boys of 11 plus. And that was to include gardening, looking after poultry, rabbits. Um, this is where the school garden across the road from the school at the bottom of the score um, was taken over and eventually in, enlarged as well. And it is remembered by some of the older men in the village because it was for boys only. Uh, they remembered gardening there and really enjoying that when they were young. Mr Westbrook had been quite a key figure in the village. Uh, he was succeeded by a Mr. Johnson, who, who introduced the new uniform and the gardening. It seemed to me, looking at the school register, that names were gradually changing too post-war. And so rather than the traditional royal or biblical names, 
we, which were still around, but there, was a, there were new post-war choices, like Joyce, for instance. There were several Joyces in the village. Phyllis, Marjorie, it, Lillian, Irene, Kenneth, Roy, Morris, Graham, Nigel. So there are the gardening boys and the 20, 1929 pupils. I think it's this one where there were three Joyces just in that uh, little group there. The school log also records, records frequent closures for epidemics of measles, chickenpox, mumps, German measles, scarlet fever, impetigo. And in 1923, before he left, the head John Westbrook wrote that on the 27th of September, for the first time since he started in 1885, all the children were present in the afternoon. Obviously a rarity, and that was only for half a day. In 1928, his successor commented that there'd been many absences from measles, chickenpox, colds, and there seemed to be a lack of robustness. We tend to think of rural life being a healthy one, with many of the children living on farms or in the estate cottages. But of course there was no immunization and uh, they went down with all sorts of illnesses. Some old farming pictures here, feeding the ducks on the top left. Huge old Gloucester Old Spot, which seems to be the most popular breed in the village. And haymaking down in the 1920s in the Garston area, obviously still using horses as you can see. The Wills estate owned the majority of the farms and also many of the cottages and houses in Blagden, but also Buckham, Burrington and Langford. Some nearer the lake, farms and cottages were owned by Bristol Waterworks, for instance, yew tree cottages in Garston Lane, which they had built, the inspection house, the engineer's house. But they'd also taken over um, Court Farm and so and other farms too to add to a buffer for the reservoir. In 1919, the, the uh, electoral roll gives us 23 farms just in Blagden Parish. Was some land used for commercial growing, raspberries, for instance, below the Garstons area, and uh, working country holidays were offered. The workers were bussed from a camp in Brockley Coombe, which had been in an internment camp during the war, it was then offering country holidays with the opportunity to work on a farm. This picture actually shows um, probably just after the war, but previous to that, um, local women had also worked in the fields there. Whortleberries were also collected from Blackdown to sell to the town shops. 1937 was a particularly good year, but it was pointed out in the newspaper that it was very hard work. The bushes are low, um, quite prickly, dense, and an experienced picker might manage 12 pounds a day. Lord Winterstoke had provided the village club initially for his workers, no bar, but a reading room. Later in 1931, Lady Wills opened a new skittle alley with electric fires and lights and in 1933 gave the club a full-size billiard table. At that time, there were 115 members, up from 75 the year before. And in 1935, the club opened to women with equal rights and also to school leavers between the ages of 14 and 16, just between 7 and 9 p.m. In latter days, Lloyd's Bank would use a room in the club for three hours a week. The parish room, now the school hall, had been built by uh, Lord Winterstoke while the church was being uh, renovated. Um, it was now run by a committee rented from the Wills estate and had to raise funds to cover its rent. But it was used for all the social occasions, meetings, dances, etc., that were held in the village. But times changed in 1928, Reverend Menzies Lambrick died, and in 1929, there was the induction of the new um, rector, Edward Marriott. Also in 1928, Sir George Alfred Wills, who'd succeeded as Lord of the Manor, died, um, and he was succeeded by his son, George Vernon Wills. However, Vernon Wills died 
at the age of 43, not that long afterwards, in 1931. And he was succeeded by his son, George Peter Vernon Wills, uh, aged only nine. So it was Lady Wills, Vernon's wife, who actually ran the estate for many, many years. In 1921, the Vernon Wills family were living in Langford Court and George Will's daughter, Hilda, was living in Coombe Lodge, each with several servants. Um, George didn't really move to Blagden, he stayed at his home in Bristol. So Vernon Wills um, decided that he would like a new Coombe Lodge, the old one at the top left, and the new one designed by a well-known architect from Bristol, George Oakley, at the bottom. It took four years to build and it employed many local laborers and craftsmen. The main builders were Cowlins of uh, Bristol, well, very well known in the area. Vernon Wills never actually lived in the new house. He, was, he died while he was still living in Langford Court. And of course, um, Coombe Lodge is now a, a wedding venue conference center and the Wills family are back in Langford Court. Lovely picture of the drive being made. You can see that there is steam power, there's a steam roller there, but also I'm pretty sure a horse in the background there. Lots of manual labour, so this accounted for a lot of employment in the village during those four years in particular. Our next timeline starts from 1930. Amy Johnson flew, electric lights, the railway closed, um, and we start hearing about unemployment, three million in 1932. There was a road traffic bill with tests in 34, and Nordrack Sanatorium would cease to exist. And that again had uh, employed a lot of local people. Regarding the depression, a um, message from the bishop, which was published in the parish magazine um, in 1931, when there were two million unemployed, um, spoke about unemployment, the dole, and the effects it was having. And at the time, the local director, um, Reverend Marriott, said in his uh, sort of uh, written piece in there, that in Blagden, unemployment is practically non-existent, and there's no sign of material or moral depression. Um, presumably, their work on the new house, Coombe Lodge, and the, the estate still running um, um, accounted for that um, employment um, not being too much of a problem. However, in 1933, after the Coombe Lodge um, building had been finished, Marriott refers to a past year of foreboding and fear, a distress of nations with perplexity. And he does refer now to unemployment. In 33 as well, the clerk to the Rural District Council Unemployment Works Committee asked the parish council in Blagden if they had any suggestions to make regarding work for the unemployed. And they made the following, all open ditches to be piped and filled in. And we know they were all the way down Church Street and probably Station Road as well. Uh, all the iron gates in the paths leading to the church to be painted. Whether that happened, I'm not sure, probably. Tourism was becoming very important to the village. Um, originally, many had come by train to look at the, uh, the building of the reservoir, or the, not so just after the building, but to look at the reservoir. The pumping station was a major attraction. And uh, people would be brought up the hill uh, to then move on into the village and on up onto Mendip. Now more people were traveling by car and bus and the bus company from Bristol would be running lots of tours out to Blagden and the Mendip. But they were also looking for accommodation and sustenance. The trout fishing had become world famous and attracted many visitors to fish or just to look at the lake. And uh, the fishing lodge was refurbished in 1927 with a thatched roof. It had had a tin roof previously. And you can see an old car, 1927 era, parked outside. And at Glen Sheen, which was the one I mentioned earlier that um, the Lyons and Colette Mallison had moved into, was fairly newly built, 1929-30. Um, by the later 30s, it was a guest house and cafe. 
the Mendip Bungalow Hotel, which became very well known. It was advertising holidays and accommodation from the 1920s. Uh, it had electric light and uh, the fresh air of the Mendips, wonderful views. There was also the West End Cafe. This is where um, Mrs. Jaggard lives uh, in the narrow part of High Street. It became a temperance hotel as well. And then there was the Lake Restaurant and Accommodation in the village, opposite Court Lodge where the history group meets. And uh, they were offering uh, both accommodation upstairs and food downstairs. That was built by Wills initially as a restaurant for his workers. When it closed as a restaurant, uh, they continued to take people upstairs. Uh, so the accommodation continued. And uh, downstairs became the rent office for the, the Wills estate. Blagden Court, um, which I mentioned previously, has had belonged to the Newnham family, inherited by Mrs. Lambrick, their daughter. She sold it um, to Matilda Hallen, who was a nurse, who opened the first, first of all, a nursing home in 1921, and then guest accommodation. There was there were some cottages as well. It was more than just the one house. And uh, so she was offering nursing accommodation and uh, visitors. Uh, advertising all the attractions of coming to Blagden. She struggled financially with accounting and so on, and eventually became bankrupt and had to move on. And it was sold in 1935 to Lady Wills. Um, at one time, she probably thought she might um, move into it, but uh, that, that didn't actually happen. And in the war, it was housed, it housed American troops, and later it was sold on to a Henry Russet in 1946. Ellick House was another guest house at the top of the Coombe. Um, the close next to the church was advertising rooms at one time. And in 1937, the Bristol branch of the National Council for Women set up a Wayfarers Club holiday home for working girls from Bristol in Fairways at the top of Rogate. Coach tours, as I mentioned, became popular coming out from Bristol, the Royal Blue Company there's one of their vehicles. And they were advertising, for instance, a new tour through the Chew Valley, climbing to the top of the Mendip Hills, past the Nordrack to the Mendip Bungalow, where tea arrangements are good, and return down the famous Burrington Coombe to Langford, home by the beautiful Broccoli Coombe, home about 9.30. So that's actually quite a lot to pack into an afternoon and evening, but it was obviously a very popular and beautiful route. There was a suggestion that the village should have a public convenience because of all the visitors coming through, um, but finding a site failed, and so that didn't actually happen during our period. With all the additional motoring uh, came the need for garages, so we had two. The central garage you see here, which is in the narrow part of the high street next to the house called Oakwell. Um, the old parsonage is on this side here behind the trees. And there was another garage known as Robert's Garage next to the Seymour Arms, where Mead Terrace now is, which had pumps on the other side of the road. Robert Crawford, who ran this central garage for some time, uh, went bankrupt in the 1930s, whether as a result of the Depression, we don't really know. And all his stock in trade assets, including three cars and two petrol pumps, were up for auction, along with his house, Oakwell, garden, all his furniture and effects. After the war, uh, Ted Marsh took it on and he became quite well known for his fleet of lorries that he operated from there. This is Robert's garage uh, next to the Seymour Arms. Uh, his pumps were on the other side of the road where there's now a bungalow. This is the view from the mead looking across at it. And this is uh, his window probably at Christmas time, but full of torches, wireless sets, batteries, etc. The garages also provided cars for taxi services, weddings, hire generally, 
and um, Roberts, this, this one here, had quite a fleet from 1909 onwards. Now the Mendip garage, which uh, this is a much more modern picture of it, clearly. Um, but Jacob Lyons had moved down from where his wife had the shop, Lanton Cottage, and uh, had this garage here where he then ran his coaches and uh, had the contract for lots of outings and then eventually the school coaches as well. This is one of his Sharabanks. And this is his daughter, Olive Irene, um, who drove lots of the coaches. And in 1929 was the subject of an article, very um, patronizing article, I might say, in one of the local newspapers about how this young woman not only drove motorbikes or rode motorbikes, um, but she drove the Sharabanks and she was very down to earth character. Jacob Lyons had his first Shara Bank in 1913, so very early on. A rather nice advert from 1936 of some, oh, sorry, I'll go back one, of some cars that were for sale. I particularly like the 1929 and a half Morris Oxford that was able to tow a trailer and a caravan. Um, but the one of interest to us really is the one at the bottom, which was being sold by Redwood, the family in the main stores, a Morris Cowley Saloon, 1928. Um, that's at the bottom, something like it would have looked like. Now, some people felt the road through Blagden with a number of uh, buses, etc., was very dangerous because of all the bends. And there was a proposal that there should be a new road, a bypass in effect. And this um, person was writing in the newspaper that he was in favour of the new road because there are 30 or 40 buses a day passing through. Sharp, steep turn below the Seymour Arms, turned by the club. Um, corner just below the Queen Adelaide and into the Coombe, and he felt that it was very dangerous. And I believe that um, the idea of the new road was also um, mooted by someone who had stepped out of the lake restaurant, where there is no pavement, of course, and it's on a sharp bend, and nearly got run over. So it was decided that that was a very dangerous place and perhaps something could be done about it. This was the proposal. Here is the Seymour Arms sign. There's Glen Sheen there. And uh, so the road, it was suggested, instead of going on that sharp right-hand turn down the high street, should go more or less straight on, just in front of that house and through the gap behind, across the orchards, round the bend of the coombe, keeping nearer to the trees, and come out onto the road somewhere opposite the lodge, somewhere down here. So you'd be avoiding these sharp turns down here through the buildings. It never happened. Also uh, concerning the roads, it was suggested in 20, 1929 that in future main roads could be tarred with granite chippings um, instead of using sand to surface them, which had been the case. But the local parish council thought that that was not very suitable for Blagden because of the hilly roads and it was proposed that they still used sand instead of granite chippings on the steeper parts of the roads. But we do know that, as I mentioned before, that in 1930 the road through Blagden was closed for um, tar spraying. The tour of the Mendips had mentioned passing Nordrack and here is the Nordrack sanatorium a large house with lots of chalets built in its grounds. Started in 1899 um, for treating people with consumption and tubercular diseases. Um, set up by a Dr. Roland Thurnham who'd been successfully treated himself for TB at a Nordic sanatorium in the Black Forest in Germany. Patients were asked to bring chairs of their own for sitting outside and warm clothes. They had a wireless in their rooms and they were paying but seven, six or five guineas a week, depending on their room, um, and possibly for many months. So they were people with some money. But the house was, uh, had extensive grounds, beautiful gardens, and a very, very favorable staff to patient ratio. Um, and so lots of local em employment, both 
in as nurses and doctors carers, but also in the grounds. After the sanatorium closed, it seems to have stayed empty until 1940, when it was taken over by the Bristol Children's Hospital during the Blitz. Of course, there was no National Health Service during the 20s and 30s, so the village relied on a couple of doctors visiting and a district nurse. Her services were paid for by a local charity chaired by Lady Wills, and they held fundraising events all through the year. One fate in Coombe Lodge Gardens in 1922 had a thousand visitors. In 1921, the current nurse, Nurse Selly, moved to a new district because she found Blagden and Charterhouse too hilly. Nurse Rosina Hale was appointed and she was still in post in 1939. She lived in one of the East End bungalows built by the Wills in the school. Parishioners would pay into a fund to entitle them to nurses' visits and the committee obviously sponsored it too. Uh, in 1932, it was reported the nurse had made 1,627 visits. In 1938, uh, the Midwife Council decreed that nurse midwives should receive £165 a year. And so I think that was a considerable increase in her salary at that time. As an intriguing aside, in November 1925, a Dr. Cool Hibbert, possibly a school doctor, prescribed chocolates containing iodine salts to prevent goiter to girls at school aged 10 to 12. During the 20s, the doctors were Dr. Pinio and Dr. Melvin, and they set up surgeries in Blagden homes. Dr. Pinio in the old farmhouse belonging to Walter Bath in Church Street, and then in number one High Street cottages, uh, the Wills cottages just below the Adelaide. Dr. Melvin used Redwood Cottage in Mead Lane and a room in Tommy Brunt's cottage on the junction of Bath Road with Liberty Lane. Friendly societies, which we heard more about recently, um, were still operating. Um, some were now hoping to operate the National Insurance Scheme, which started in 1911, whereby, whereby employers paid stamps for their employees, which entitled them to sick pay, but I think not a pension. But in the 1930s, there were other uh, clubs operating, a thrift club, which paid out to its members at Christmas, a rational association, friendly society, which had 91 members paying out in times of sickness. The Bristol hospitals were supported by the village, their harvest festival services uh, always supported them and there were fundraising Alexandra Rose flag days in aid of the hospitals every year. A dentist came to the village once a week for a few hours. And in 1936, a hospital contributory scheme was set up. The idea was that members would pay a penny for every pound of earning and that doctors supporting the scheme would give their services free. There were other weekly contributions which could be made on a sliding scale for free hospital treatment or to cover a family or to receive cash benefits if you weren't able to work for six weeks. One of the charities supported by the village was the Waifs and Strays. Seems a very antiquated term to us now, but it provided homes for orphans. Daisy Wood, um, a woman who lived in the village for a, uh, a lot of her life up in Swiss Cottage, the daughter of Frederick Wood, who was a very well-known solicitor, um, raised funds for this and many other charities. She was a very busy woman. People would have collecting boxes in their homes, which she would take in annually, and the village between them funded a cot for a baby or toddler in the Bedminster home. As the children grew older, they moved on to another home and then the Blagton Cot would have a new named occupant. As with many of the other charities, dances, whist drives, concerts and drama were always popular ways to raise money. And annually, the children held a flag day for something called the Police Court Mission. This was actually funding a home in Bath for 30 delinquents. Apparently a hundred would pass through in a year. And according to the rector who felt it was an excellent scheme, only a few failed to make good. So our final timeline, 1935, the Silver Jubilee of King George V. In the same year, the dedication of the chancel screen and candelabra, I'll come back to in a moment. 
1936, the funeral of George V, the abdication of his son, Edward VIII, George VI succeeded, and in 1937, Coronation Day. And then we know that the war came soon afterwards. The Wills family commissioned a new rood screen for the church and candelabra, which is hidden um, by the screen, um, in memory of Sir George and his son, Sir Vernon Wills. And later in the year, a rood, which is the crucifix and the cross at the top here, um, was erected above the screen in memory of Reverend Lambrick. There was also a move of the font to a new position near the door where it is now with a new cover and plinth and some of the pews were rearranged. So uh, Rev. Rick Lambrick had died in uh, 28, so it was some time before that came to be, but there was general fundraising for that. By the 1920s, the flower shows had been revived. There were fates and garden revels in the rectory gardens to try and make up for a shortfall in church funds. A lot of those were organized by the ringers and there would be things like coconut shies, penalty kick, guess the pig's weight, usual things for a fate. And they also sold cockles, ices. There were lots of stalls and there was always a dance in the evening. The village knew how to celebrate. And in the mid thirties, there were several occasions. In 35, the Royal Silver Jubilee of George V, there were lots of uh, decorated floats. Uh, uh, oh, let's go back one. And onto the mead, a gateway of greenery was erected. God save the king. And another float down here, all parading. And marquee was put up on the mead. And a fancy dress parade assembled at Coombe Lodge and walked to the mead led by the band. There were sports, games and tea, a beacon on Mendip, which was one of a line around the country, floats, fancy dress. Lovely beard at the top there. The fancy dress on the left, the tea ladies, this one was called. There were suggestions for a permanent memorial, depending on how much money was raised, um, for the Silver Jubilee, including a swimming pool for children, a recreation field, a system of public lighting, an ornamental garden on Blagdon Hill. Uh, Lady Wills actually offered the mead to the village um, in 1937 and dedicated an oak shelter, which is still there as the bus shelter overlooking the mead as a Jubilee Memorial, and they were dedicated in 1938, the following year. Beacons were built up on top of Blackdown. You can make out the size of them from the small figures climbing up and down. And coach tours would come out from Bristol to climb Blackdown and view the line of beacons. The Blackdown flower shows had been running for 50 years by 1935, so very well established. Major event and lots of photographs do survive. There were competitions of all sorts, 50 classes. One year, the children exhibited 400 queen wasps and 3,000 white cabbage butterflies in the pest class. After the judging, the marquee was always used for dancing in the evening. You can see there were lots of different uh, fair type stalls there. Um, Bert Gallup of um, this say, it says fir tree farm, that's wrong, it should say yew tree farm, uh, had his exhibition of vegetables. And this I think is Ted Marsh in the, in the center with his, with his carrots. Two years later, King George V died, Edward VIII abdicated, and now George VI and Elizabeth were to be crowned. And so there was an opportunity for more celebrations. The Silver Jubilee Committee reconvened and now they organised a united service on the Mead, fancy dress including nine classes of comical or historical characters, a British Legion tableau entitled The Village Backsmith, sports races for all ages, a meat tea for adults, cake tea for children, and every child under 14 
to receive a mug filled with chocolates. And at 10 p.m., a beacon fire on the ham this time at night. In the afternoon, the King's speech was broadcast, followed by community singing. But over these years, it was becoming obvious that Europe was in trouble, mentioned several times in the parish magazine, and our final slide, gas masks being distributed in 1939. So some parallels with our own situation today, we've just had the Jubilee celebrations, but we also have war in Europe. A fascinating 20 years. And my thanks to uh, Sheila Johnson in particular, because she has provided so many of the bits of information, the pictures, the photographs, the paper cuttings, and has a wealth of knowledge about the village during this time. So thank you to Sheila and uh, Andrew Adicott's archive too. Thank you. <laughs>